Welcome to the Triple Point Podcast, a podcast for those working at the intersection of weather and climate, technology, and society. We focus on innovators and leaders working to make our community safe and resilient in the face of a dynamic and ever-changing world. I'm your host, Ryan Harris. And this month, we were lucky to have Matt Stein join the Triple Point. Matt is the CEO of startup Salient Predictions, a company focused on combining novel environmental data with machine learning and climate expertise to deliver accurate predictions up to a year into the future. You'll hear about how sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction helps the energy, ag, and insurance sectors buy down future environmental risk, the importance of serving data connoisseurs, and Matt's own circuitous journey landing him as the CEO at Salient. We hope you enjoy February's episode. On with the show. Hey, well, welcome to the February episode of the Triple Point Podcast. We have a great guest today. We've got Matt Stein, the CEO of Salient Predictions, and we're going to introduce him in just a bit. But as we normally do in our shows, we like to kick the episodes off with a look at the news. And there's a couple of big things, and it's really germane to the topic that we're going to be talking about today uh, when it comes to salient innovations. You know, the oceans drive a lot of what we have going on in the weather and climate world. Uh, Forecasters at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center recently issued a La Nina watch and signaling the end of the recent El Nino. It's a big deal because obviously the shift in weather patterns that El Nino and La Nina drive, whether it's flooding rains, atmospheric rivers, or drought conditions, that could be a potential change on the horizon. Already this year, we've seen increased anomalies, warm anomalies, particularly across the midsection of the country, where instead of midwinter, it's feeling already like spring. Some of that has to do with the current El Nino pattern. We'll see if that shifts in in the next year or two as we look at this La Nina happening. And more atmospheric rivers. We talked about atmospheric rivers last year around this time impacting the western U.S., And we've already had a couple of significant atmospheric river events where we're getting essentially a season's worth of precipitation in just a matter of a day or two. And there's more atmospheric rivers looming on the horizon for California. The last news item that I wanted to kind of get a little bit of a teaser out there because we're trying to plan for a a follow-on guest to this. And this is There's a lot of news in the last year, and we actually had a little bit of this in a previous podcast, this idea of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. It's basically a fancy concept for how water gets transported to and from the equator and poles. And there's a lot of research happening. There's been a lot of research really over the last 20 years that has shown that the AMOC is potentially slowing down. There could be a tipping point for future climate conditions in the decades and centuries ahead. So while that is way off into the future and way beyond the predictive scale that we're going to talk with Matt today about, uh, it is something uh, germane here when we talk about the effect of the oceans on the climate system. So I want to go ahead and bring Matt on. Matt Stein is the CEO and co-founder of Salient Predictions, which provides AI-based sub-seasonal to seasonal weather forecasts and analytics. Prior to Salient, Matt was the head of business development and the first employee at Jupiter Intelligence, a leader in climate risk analytics. Before that, he started and sold an air quality analytics company and worked at large companies including GE and Exelon Energy. Matt, it's great to have you on the Triple Point podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. It's great to see you. Likewise. And we got a chance to actually link up at the American Meteorological Society a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was great to meet you face to face. And I know your team had uh, at least a couple, if not more, presentations talking about the different things uh, that you're doing at Salient Predictions. But before we get into that, we always like to ask our guests the first question, which is, how would you describe your journey up to this point? Yeah. um, Gosh, I've always been the type of person that, you know, kind of looks over the horizon and sees a general destination of where I want to go, but uh, only the vaguest of ideas in terms of details and how to get there. But I do find that at least having like a destination in mind, right, it it helps solutions start to uh, emerge if you're observant. So I 
I think back to college when I decided that I wanted to run companies that were positive for the environment. And I didn't know what kind of companies, big, small. And the route for me to get here was pretty circuitous. I studied civil and environmental engineering at Stanford. Um, and then I actually took a series of, of standard, I would just call them businessy jobs, right? Investment banking and consulting in New York and Boston. And not many people know this, but I took a detour for two years and became a high school history teacher. <laughs> oh, very <laughs> which, cool. Which I absolutely loved, uh, but it decided for me that at the time uh, it wasn't right. So I went to back to MBA. Coming out, uh, I really wanted to start that that business, right? But uh, at the time, my wife and I also had two young kids, uh, so it wasn't the perfect timing for us. So uh, I ended up jumping into a rotational program at General Electric, GE, um, which was a really just an excellent environment for me to essentially be an entrepreneur in a big company. So a couple of years into GE, I ended up in a role where I was helping define the commercial strategy of more than a dozen different uh, software and analytics products across the company. So, you know, these were products in renewable energy, aviation, uh, thermal generation, uh, healthcare, oil and gas. So I, I just learned so much in that experience and I built such a strong professional network there that, you know, as I think back, that was a really big part of my foundation, big part of the journey. I also started my first startup while I worked at GE and nights and weekends, and it was focused on air quality analytics. I, I sort of fell in love with the technology of, you know, tiny air quality sensors emerging and uh, some of the geospatial and calibration technology that was coming out around that. And I, I liked the idea of, of a data set that kind of helped level the playing field of so many of the inequities that are out there. You know, you think about lower income households living at the foot of polluting refineries and just sort of making that more visible. So I ended up leaving GE full time uh, or to, to pursue this full time. Um, but about a year in, I realized that, you know, at least from my perspective, the market for the data felt a little bit limited and it felt kind of slow to adopt. So when an acquisition offer came in, my co-founder and I kind of jumped on it and you know, I like to say that the, the paperwork literally for that acquisition, we wrapped it up on a Friday and that next Monday I was back at GE, <laughs> but this time <laughs> in a totally different part of the organization, I was in their ventures group and I was helping them source investment opportunities for various data companies. So, you know, you think about the uh, earth observation companies that we all know about, like Planet and a bunch of different weather companies. Um, so it's really like a nice opportunity to just see the landscape of what was coming out uh, from a technology standpoint. It's called an entrepreneur in residence role. And I highly recommend it. It's kind of like a sabbatical. And during that time, uh, I started chatting with a lot of startups, uh, including uh, someone that I knew who was starting a company called Jupiter Intelligence, which was uh, really, you know, the plan was to focus on helping customers predict and manage their future physical climate risk, right? How we're their risks changing from floods, extreme temperatures, wildfire, et cetera. They were, you know, essentially they were taking CMIP global climate models and turning them into more enterprise grade decision tools. So when Jupiter was funded, I think a couple of days later, I became the first employee leading business development for them. And I spent the next four years uh, building the business, right? Selling into banks and insurance firms and uh, energy companies, uh, various corporate entities, real estate companies, and I, I just absolutely loved it. In particular, I loved the depth of the science and R&D team. And, you know, I loved serving what I like to call data connoisseurs, right, uh, within our, our customer accounts. You know, that term, when I, when I use the term data connoisseurs, what I mean is, is people, right? Often these are PhDs um, in meteorology, climate science, um, or another related technical field to appreciate the care that goes into creating really excellent data products, right? Reliable, accurate, good methodology. I think that, you know, these data connoisseurs, they're, they're in every organization, right? But they really appreciate that, you know, in order to make big financial decisions, they need to have confidence uh, in that data. During my fourth year at Jupiter, I was approached by Salient Predictions which I had never heard of. And uh, at the time, Salient was essentially, it was a former senior scientist uh, from the Woods Hole Institute. Uh, his name is Ray Schmidt. Um, his last doctoral, postdoctoral student from the MIT Woods Hole 
program, uh, Sam Levang, uh, and Ray's son, who is a machine learning specialist. And they were a very technical team and they needed someone to lead the company, especially on the business side. And I wasn't really ready to make a job. But I think the more I got to know uh, them and the problem that they were solving, the more conviction I got. I sort of saw Salient as a great opportunity to make this sub-seasonal to seasonal or S2S. You know, we think of it as like two weeks out to a year in advance. I, I saw this as a really great opportunity to make that space of S2S, the forecast more mainstream, right? The model accuracy at that point, and this is a couple of years ago, had really plateaued. But with some of the new technologies and approaches, you know, what if we could make S2S more accurate, more reliable, more usable? That was really something that kept kind of gnawing at me um, as I was thinking about whether to make the jump. Also, Salient has some of the same like deep science DNA that Jupiter had. Um, and I knew the benefit of that type of foundation in a company. And lastly, you know, S2S was essentially adjacent to what I was doing at Jupiter, which was, you know, looking at risks from more of a decadal climate view. Um, the modeling was different. The use cases were different. So I wasn't competing with Jupiter, which gave me a lot of comfort. Um, so yeah, I ended up making the leap. I joined as co-founder and CEO, you know, and that set in motion a whole bunch of things. My family and I moved out from California where Jupiter's headquarters were to New England to be closer to Salient's founding team. I met new schools for the kids, closer to our extended family. So the stars uh, kind of aligned with all of this. And I've loved every minute of the, the journey building this business so far. Um, you know, it's been two and a half years. I've been at Salient. The team is super motivated and talented. You know, we've got a, a great product that we're rapidly enhancing with, you know, working with a lot of demanding customers, you know, our, these data connoisseurs I talked about, we are collaborating with great research partners and we've brought a lot of the, you know, right investors into the mix. So yeah, I mean, I, I look back at my old college self who, you know, just vaguely thought, Hey, someday I want to run, you know, environmentally positive companies. And I, I feel good, right? I feel aligned that uh, I'm, I'm in that general spot where I envisioned myself. But, you know, honestly, the fun for me is, is more in the journey itself than reaching some destination. So yeah, that's a little bit of my story. No, that's awesome. There's so much to unpack there. And I, I really like this idea of, you know, I think about when you, the whole time you're describing it from start to finish there in that last little bit is the arc the arc of your career. And, you know, when I was at AMS a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to talk to a bunch of students, early career professionals. That's a big question that they have is, you know, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? And, you know, what is that kind of arc? But I think the message, and we have a lot of students who actually tune in and, and to the Triple Point podcast, the message that I hear in that is, you know, stay true to yourself, have that vision for maybe where you want to be, see it as a journey, see it as an arc, really impactful words there. And so there's other stuff I really want to unpack there. The data connoisseurs, I really like the way that you term that. So you talked a little bit, you know, about salient predictions and what some of the science background at, out of Woods Hole and Ray's work in starting that. Talk to us a little bit about salient, you know, how did the company get its start and Maybe talk a little bit about some of the markets that Salient sure. is supporting. Yeah, high level uh, three markets, energy, ag, and insurance. And I can unpack that for you a little bit. I, on the energy side, we spend a lot of time with energy financial trading. Um, so, you know, think about commodity trading, right? Natural gas, options, futures, power and electricity. There's, you know, they're sold on, on, on auction or on commodity exchanges. Um, so we work with like hedge funds, banks that have commodity desks, big energy companies with commodity trading desks. We also work with big renewable energy owners and operators that uh, are thinking about sort of physical power productions and hedging strategies. So you, know, you can imagine if, if you are an energy company, you have a lot of hydropower and wind and solar resources, you need to commit blocks of power into the grid and those blocks are obviously variable. <laughs> They're very weather dependent. So, you know, how much do you hedge to make sure that that you can deliver on those commitments and, and not pay the huge penalties if you don't show up on the grid? It's typically a lot more economical to take preventative action, right? To, to hedge today 
uh, versus going unhedged and then having to buy power in the spot market, which could be really expensive. So there's a lot of other opportunities in the energy sector for what we call operational resilience. So you know, think about when to schedule the right maintenance windows uh, for generation and transmission assets, or even integrating into other models. Like we're very well suited to integrate into vegetation growth models. Uh, vegetation management, obviously a big issue for utility is wildfire, same thing. Uh, if you think about wildfire risk models, a lot of what's focused on today is how wildfires spread, but you can also understand those risk models weeks and months in the future. So integrating into those, there's a bunch of other use cases. We're actually working with a few consultants to help accelerate that market. In the ag sector, you know, weather is the number one predictor of crop yield and quality. Similar to energy, we're working in commodity trading in ag. So contracts in corn, wheat, soy, coffee, sugar, the, the list goes on. You know, there are ag supply companies who sell crop inputs, right? These are seeds or other nutrients that farmers need. So these companies need to think about sales and marketing and inventory and, you know, all of that in the context of what the likely growing conditions will be in the coming seasons. Supply chain is a big issue, uh, right? Food and Bev companies have to uh, manage their inputs, right? And they often have pretty tight quality specifications in quantities and prices that they're trying to sort of manage through AB InBev is a company we've talked about publicly. We're Working with them, barley is obviously a key input to their beer. So thinking through strategies there, um, financing and lending into the agriculture sector, right? Organizations that lend to farmers. I think what's pretty common across agriculture is that our data ends up flowing into some sort of a crop yield model, you know, which today we're not building, uh, but we're spending a lot of time thinking about how to most efficiently integrate uh, our outputs into those models. And then insurance is also an area of focus for us. I think the big use case in insurance today for us is around loss avoidance, right? How do we essentially power messages that are sent by insurance companies to their customers before a potentially damaging event, right? Like a severe precipitation or cold, you know, how do, we, how do they let customers know in advance what's likely to happen, how to take preventative measures, things like that. So working closely with Zurich uh, Insurance on this. Uh, it's actually interesting that the data shows that when you send these messages to customers uh, and when they take action, the retention of those customers is quite a bit higher. And there's a bunch of other efficiencies that insurance firms see from these kinds of proactive measures. And then underwriting, there is an increase uh, in parametric policies, right? Essentially, these are insurance policies where a, a payout happens if there's some index or a threshold that's crossed. For example, a specific amount of precipitation for crop insurance, right? The USDA manages a big program around this in the US, but there's a lot more innovation, less regulation, in some other countries where we're involved with. So it's a, it's a pretty big range uh, when you talk about energy, agriculture, and insurance, you know, and we have to be very thoughtful in terms of how we sequence and prioritize those. But I think there's a lot of market to go after. So that's really exciting uh, for us. Um, Salient was, was founded at the end of 2019. So as I mentioned, I joined up with the team uh, in the summer of 21. Uh, so about a year and a half into the founding of the company. The backstory of Salient is that in the early, uh, you know, sort of 2010s, uh, my co-founder Ray did a lot of research connecting sea surface salinity patterns to precipitation patterns on land. And the research community was, was just starting to get some really good data from the Argo float program, uh, which uh, is about 4,000 temperature and salinity profiling sensors that are, you know, kind of bobbing around the ocean. The spark for the company was in 2017, 18, uh, when the U S Bureau of Reclamation, which manages the water resources in the U S West uh, and NOAA, the climate prediction centers, they partnered on a subseasonal forecast rodeo. So each entrant would essentially submit rain and temperature forecasts for week three through six lead times for an entire year. And then they would back test that model to make sure that that year wasn't just a fluke. So Team Salient entered the contest. It was essentially Ray and his sons, and they applied machine learning techniques to some of Ray's research around the connection between salinity and precipitation. And Surprising to them, they won the temperature or the precipitation category handily, beating out all kinds of research groups and professional forecasters. 
Um, and they won 250K, which became some of the seed capital for the company. So I will say, side note, we are eternally grateful to the US government for helping us get uh, started as a company. I joined up a year and a half later and brought more capital into the company, brought some investors on board. I hired the leadership team and others, and we're now 17 people, pretty heavy on the R&D. Ultimately, it was uh, pretty funny. We ended up hiring the climate scientist who won the temperature side of the forecast rodeo <laughs> in 2017 <laughs> and 18. And his name is Brian Zimmerman. He's been a great addition to the team. Uh, I really love working with him. And interesting side note, uh, I chatted at AMS with Noah and the CPC. Um, and it sounds like there's another S2S rodeo coming up in 2025. So uh, I know the pressure is definitely on for Team Salient. And I'm looking forward to all the other competitors out there joining up. It should be really fun. So when I hear about all the different use cases, and, and you know, I've looked at the subseasonal, the seasonal realm for at least a decade now before it was S2S. And some of this is just like getting the light to turn on for some of these uh, markets, right? Uh, to, to understand how they can use weather and climate information. When you're going out and talking to these different sectors, whether it's ag or insurance or energy, how much has the light already been on for some of these companies and sectors versus how much are you in your company able to show and, and demonstrate to them the value of using the information out of salient at the S2S level? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's, it's an important question, right? Because it gets to how quickly can we grow the market? Um, and it's something that we think about, something our investors think about. Yeah, I would broadly categorize customers into a few buckets. One is, I think, exemplified by energy traders, right? They have used S2S forecasts for years. They understand the limitations, many of them, especially folks in Europe, understand how to work with probabilistic forecasts. So I think for them, you know, they've already been sold, right? They understand the benefits. Other use cases, a lot of folks in the hydropower sector, um, they work off of climatology, right? And climatology for, you know, your, your listeners is a fancy way of saying historical averages. Um, so they might take the average of the last 30 years of precipitation in their catchment area um, and say that the next rainy season is going to essentially look like that. We really tried to work with those companies and educate them on, you know, not just the skill that, you know, a forecasted view like ours can bring, uh, but also, you know, the benefit uh, from an economic dollars and cents standpoint uh, of what moving into a forecast can bring for them. And then there's sort of this third category of companies, and we've worked with several of them, that they have an instigator somewhere in the company that knows they should be moving into a forecasted world, but their decision models are written based on some deterministic input into their models. So they haven't yet sort of evolved into a world where they're comfortable making probabilistic decisions, right? Working with the full distribution uh, of outcomes and coming up with a more nuanced view of the decision. So yeah, I would say there's certainly an opportunity for us to play a role in educating those types of customers uh, and working with them and you know pushing ourselves, right? To not think as just a forecaster, but think of ourselves as a company that does excellent forecasts that are reliable and accurate, but also translates those into business value. We, we really have to push ourselves to play that role in the market, not just for our own benefit, but in support of you know everyone that's in the S2S space. Yeah, one of the themes that if, if you listen to enough Triple Point podcasts, we talk about the understanding of you know weather and climate risk information, risk decisions that get made on that. I mean, you can translate that to obviously business risk and, and that sort of thing. And this idea of, a translation from a deterministic mindset to probabilistic is difficult for most people, but basically decision-making is a lot easier for the human to think about in terms of deterministic. It either is going to happen or it's not, but realistically speaking, because of the uncertainty with weather and climate information, 
a probabilistic framework, like the one that sounds like y'all are using at Salient is a better way to connect. And I'm assuming like there's an overlap here, right? With the data connoisseurs and this instigator, uh, you know, within these companies are probably, they may be the same individual, they may not, but I imagine they're, they probably are the same to actually yeah. move to that kind of model. Is that, is that kind of what you I, see? I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, a company has to make a decision right? Buy, sell, buy somewhere else, sell, you know, now versus sell later. I mean, these are all discrete decisions that have mm -hmm. to be made. But, you know, we try to work with those types of customers to present frameworks, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of folks have, are familiar with the cost loss decision making framework, right? Which is a pretty standard in terms of making decisions under uncertainty. And again, for your listeners at a high level, it's, it's there's a probability of a very damaging event, right? There is a cost if that damaging event occurs. There is a cost to taking preventative measures. And is it worth that preventative measure, right? Given the probability weighted damage, right? It's it's a pretty simple algebraic equation, right? But I think working with customers and sometimes consulting firms that we partner with to understand how to implement that is, is really important. It's a skill, it's a capability that we're starting to lean into quite a bit. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned earlier about Climate Prediction Center, NOAA, S2S Rodeo, uh, that kind of got salient its, its kind of business roots going. How would you characterize the difference What's some of the, the special differentiator that Salient provides? And, you know, how would you characterize that as different from what, say, NOAA or Climate Prediction Center provides today? Well, first, I, I want to recognize that we're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, right? I mean, these are organizations, when I talk about, you know, NOAA, EC, MWF, you know, these are organizations that have been building and tuning S2S models for many years. So definitely recognize all the work that's gone into those models. You know, we use those models heavily. We use NOAA's GEFS model. We use uh, ECMWF's uh, extended range and seasonal models. We post-process them, we calibrate them. But I think the big difference is that in parallel, we run our own proprietary uh, AI-based models. You know, that high level, we use a combination of deep neural networks and standard statistical modeling approaches, right? Linear inverse, Monte Carlo, and so forth. And we we blend all of those models to optimize for skill scores. And we use a number of different validation metrics. We like the continuous rank probability score because, you know, as we're talking about probabilistic outputs, it, it accounts for both the accuracy and the reliability, which is really important in probabilistic modeling. But I, I think what we found is that depending on the location time scale and the metrics that we're modeling, we see anywhere from, you know, say five to 20 plus percent increased continuous rank probability score versus the next best alternative, which could be one of the government models, it could be climatology. And we like doing that uh, and making that really visible to our customers, that they, they appreciate that transparency. We like that transparency too, because it helps direct where our next model improvement is going to be, right? We find spots that need more improvement and we we get after it, right? We, we create internal uh, benchmarks for ourselves. And uh, we're launching new models essentially every uh, six months. I think that as a side note, it also, it kind of goes to show you, and this is a bit of a controversial topic, right? It, it kind of goes to show you how the private sector on certain things, we can move faster than government and academia. You know, so we sort of see our role in the ecosystem at Salina as uh, we are pushing the boundaries of what's possible at this time scale. We're trying to make the data more usable and we're encouraging people to advance, you know, beyond simply using historical averages or climatology, oh, yeah. you know, if, if we can accomplish those things, then I think we've made a, a, a difference uh, in this uh, sector in the weather, you know, community generally. I had a uh, professor, Tom Murphy, at the Naval Postgraduate School. I give him credit, full credit for this, but you know, he used to talk a lot about smart climatology, and you know, it's essentially a lot of it is stuff that we're talking about. It's using the knowledge of El Nino, La Nina, you know, the longer term oscillations to understand that, you know, your climate will be modulated by, you know, these longer signals, the oceans. And that's 
from what you're talking about, it sounds like, you know, the, the oceans are a lot of the basis, you know, whether it's salinity that, that really drive um, salience differentiation. You talked about Argo, you know, the 4,000 sensors there, like what are we missing in terms of technology? I mean, uh, to get after some of the tough problems we have in seasonal prediction, is it, is it more in situ ocean surface, subsurface sensing, satellite sensing? I mean, if you had an unlimited research budget, where would you invest the technology to make the next leap in seasonal mm -hmm. prediction? Because obviously observations fuel the goodness of the output at the end of the day. But where, where would you invest research basically to yeah. improve seasonal prediction? Gosh, this would be amazing. Um, I, I would say first before jumping in there, I, I, would, I would just offer that, uh, yes, we do use um, things like ocean temperature and salinity to drive our models. We also use uh, a number of other inputs, right? Like the water cycle has a bunch of components. Uh, what do you think? Most of it is ocean related, but there's obviously soil moisture and sea ice and snow cover and those kinds of things. All that gets pulled to our model in, into our model in addition to the traditional fields that feed into like an NWP model, like wind speed and direction and geopotential heights, those sorts of things. So it's a pretty long list of several dozen fields that flow into our ML models. But yes, you're right. I mean, machine learning models that look at big global weather patterns, they like big global data sets, ideally ones with long historical records. So unlimited research budget, I would direct a lot of those funds towards observations. You know, Argo right now has a budget of about $40 million. And gosh, just tomorrow, I know there's a there's a convening in Washington about how do we, how do we keep maintaining that system because it's expensive to run. It's expensive to put those profilers in the ocean and maintain them and ideally grow the program. So I'd immediately increase that budget 40 to, I don't know, hundred million and, you know, use that increased budget to start enriching the data, right? Higher resolution, especially spatially in undersampled parts of the ocean, like the South Atlantic is, is compared to other parts of the ocean that are, you know, the, the North Atlantic is, is there's a huge sparsity uh, of data. You know, and it it not it doesn't just help with S two S, right? It helps with climate models generally. Um, and you mentioned AMOC earlier, right? It helps getting more uh, resolved data uh, around that. Same thing on land, right? I think you know you look at those in situ sensor, you know, sort of global maps, and there's a huge sparsity in Africa and other locations. We're doing some work with the Gates Foundation that starts to get at this problem. Uh, which is exciting. Um, so we'll be ingesting a whole new set of observational data in East Africa. Yeah, satellites are also part of the picture for sure. But I think the two, you know, in situ and satellites work in tandem, right? Because there's a lot of bias correction that that needs to happen with satellites and those trade-offs, right? Each each has its strengths and weaknesses of accuracy, ground truth versus you know, breadth of data coverage. So I think solving for that, you know, there's, there's much smarter people on that, that topic that can optimize for that equation. But uh, in general, you know, we, we need better observations uh, to continue to push forward uh, in this space. Yeah, there's a, a couple of threads that I think about pulling there. One is back to the AMOC, you know, a lot of the research that's going into that, you know, the, the one of the big drivers of uncertainty is the lack of observations, right? Um, so you're, you're spot on for bringing us back to the AMOC. You know, it's, it's, it's more than the seasonal prediction piece. It's, you know, the longer term climate model projections as well. The other thread that I'm just thinking about too, literally just hearing the likes of you know, Neil Jacobs, former NOAA administrator, talking about the value of data and the value of different data that's out there. And, and this idea that drifting buoys, when it comes to comparing them to data provided from other platforms, because there's such a dearth of sensing in the oceans compared to land surface and, and other things, drifting buoys actually provide some of the most, if not the most useful, you know, observation information out there. So anyway, just a couple of like, um, interesting points that kind of were running through my head as you were talking about yeah. that. And I mean, the longer, you know, the longer the lead time, obviously the, the key input to numerical weather predictions is the atmosphere. But as you push out, you know, two, three, four, five weeks, and then into seasons, you know, the ocean starts to govern, 
right? right. So it's it's really important to keep enhancing the, the the resolution and making that data more and more rich. Yeah, and I think I mean when you look at NOAA has a big push to you know investing in what they, they call the new blue economy, and but part of that really you know part of this is economics and commerce and that sort of thing, but part of it really is just a better fundamental understanding of what's going on in the ocean so we can make better predictions at the end of the day. So one of the big pieces that I personally like to talk about is this communication of uncertainty and risk. And that's the beauty of what we do in this field is like, we've got all this great information and you know, whether it's on the weather scales or the climate scales, but we often do just a poor job of communicating, you know, what that data mean in terms of uncertainty. So communicating uncertain seasonal predictions, it's a well-known challenge. It's not just, it's not just seasonal prediction where we have that challenge, but how is salient working to help communicate uncertainty to your customers mm -hmm. and stakeholders? Yeah, I think it, there's a few things that come to mind and it is a challenge and we're learning a lot from our customers in terms of how they want to see the information and how they're going to use the information. But I would say full distributions, right? Like presenting our customers with the full range of outcomes, right? In our models, like for, for example, just seeing the full probability density function of, of temperature, precipitation, wind, whatever it is, solar power, growing degree days, and then allowing them to compare our models to climatology, to government models, to sort of seeing very easily where they converge or where they diverge, I think mm -hmm. is, is really helpful to our customers. It gives them information on which way the market is likely to move. Uh, so that's one thing. As I sort of mentioned before, making the skill scores very transparent is helpful to our customers, right? So the ability to look at a map and see all of the back testing at every location, at every time scale, and, and click in to see detailed information. Uh, I mean, these data connoisseurs, right? They want to understand how much confidence they can put uh, in a given pixel on our map. And I think they appreciate what companies put their historical forecasts out there because I'll tell you that there's not a lot of companies, like a lot of companies are afraid to do this. Yeah. Uh, they, but like they, I said, they, they like the black box for sure. Yeah. I mean, we see it as a win win because it, it, it builds trust. We'll, we'll show them the warts at all. Right. And it helps us with our modeling. So it's, it's kind of a win win. And I think that also, you know, what comes to mind is not just putting the full distribution out there, but making it easier uh, to consume different points on that distribution. Right. So we allow our customers to essentially set different cutoff points or thresholds or get alerts when something hits a certain level. So, you know, I'll just give you an example. A customer may want to see all of the locations in, let's say, continental U.S., where there is a 25% likelihood that a temperature anomaly is five times greater than climatology, right? That's kind of complicated, right? But it's useful information uh, mm -hmm. for people who understand how to work with this data. And it gets back to your point before about, you know, this, this requires some education uh, with customers. And then I think a, an issue that keeps coming up more and more for us is using the right reference period. You know, I, and I, I think we talked about this at AMS, I forget, I, government agencies, at least publicly, right, they use 30 years as their kind of historical record um, when they look at anomalies. And internally, it might be a totally different story. I'm sure they've got all kinds of different uh, ways of looking at that. Uh, but I'll tell you, the rest, of the, the rest of the market, at least in the energy trading and commodity trading sector, they recognize that the 30-year temperature averages, like that ship has sailed um, and it's no longer reflective of reality. So they will use 10-year, seven-year, in some cases, the last five years as their historical record from which they base anomalies off of. We were doing that in the Air Force. We're moving beyond, I mean, like we, we provided the World Meteorological Organization 30-year standard, but then we would use five to 10 years because there's certainly some areas uh, where climate change is, is accelerating faster exactly. than can keep up with that 30 year time frame. So, and I really yeah. like the, this idea of the, the transparency, you know, as, as you coming back to being transparent, because that's a trust builder for sure. It is, it is. So 
you know, trying to bring all this stuff together into a cohesive product roadmap, we're just letting our customers know, right, this feature is coming out and working with our customers to prioritize you know, all of those features is something that, you know, is a lot of work, it's a lot of fun um, to just make sure that our customers are getting what they need to, to make their decisions. I think fun is a great word there uh, for my next question. And you mentioned earlier a little bit, you know, one of the demographics, obviously, that we like to cater to on the Triple Point podcast are students, early career professionals. And so, you know, what advice do you have for up and coming meteorologists, maybe even oceanographers in this case, looking for a future in this field? Uh, you had mentioned, you know, the ARC having that vision, but What's something that comes off the top of your head, you know, whether it's fun or other things uh, for yeah. up and coming uh, professionals in this area? Gosh, well, I'm, I'm neither a meteorologist nor an oceanographer, but I've worked with them. They're my colleagues and I've worked with them for, you know, about seven years now. So I'll give it a shot. I, I think that, uh, you know, my first thought is, is pick a general direction that you want to move in, right? And understand why you want to move in that direction, right? I think like just the right amount of focus on a general direction. It, it keeps you on a path, but it also allows you to be really open to how that path unfolds. For example, that first step on your path coming out of graduate or undergraduate, you know, do you want to work in the public sector? Do you want to work in academia? Do you want to work in private sector? I think each has its pros and cons and, you know, you can always kind of slip into one and slip out of the other. And, you know, so many people in the community have, just taking really creative paths, which brings me to my next point, which is jump on good opportunities because they don't last, especially opportunities with people that you respect and can learn from. And oftentimes people that you aren't really sure you can keep up with, um, because I find that that's where a lot of the growth um, happens. And ideally opportunities where you can get a lot of responsibility early on. I think that just kind of propels you on like a different arc. The other thing I say is like coming off of AMS a couple of weeks ago, you, know, you walk the exhibit hall there and you get a view of, of the value chain of this whole space of oceanography, meteorology, you know, whether it's, you know, met stations, various observations, technologies, data processing, forecasting, analytics. And then of course there's companies and organizations that are making decisions with all this information, right? I think no matter where you end up, public sector, private sector, wherever in the value chain, it's really, really important to invest in understanding at the end of the day, what decisions are made with this information, right? And I'm talking about like quantifying that in dollars and cents or community benefits or lives saved or whatever the implication is, like keep asking the questions and moving further downstream of the forecasts because that's what ultimately informs everything else in that ecosystem. And that's where, you know, the next gaps and opportunities to fill are. And then the last one I would say is technology, right? Keep your eye on the ball of where the technology trends are moving and position yourself accordingly. And, you know, that can be any number of things, right? It can be just building up your professional network or professional development or seeking or creating uh, new roles. So. Yeah, this is just a few things that come to mind. Well, you mentioned society. It's second to last point there. Um, and that's one of the three points that we have on the triple point. So one of the reasons why we started this podcast is to come back to how do, how can we improve society, right? And and I think about your how you originally started. How do we improve society through the, in the environment? So I'm going to modify my last question before we go into the lightning round and just basically ask you to give us a prediction on where I'll say it the environmental intelligence world is going to be, uh, whether from a business perspective or otherwise, but where are we going to be in five to 10 years? What's going to mm -hmm. be that next big leap, do you think? Yeah, I, I think there's going to be 10 times more collaboration between the public and private sector. I think it's just inevitable. You look at the urgency of the climate situation and the role for better forecasts to create resiliency. And at, as I, as I mentioned before, like, in many cases, the private sector can move faster than academia and government, right? The incentive structures are different. The product development cycles, the agile methodologies, the, the, the talents in the private sector, it's just, it's a different formula, right? And there's a lot of money that's pouring into climate technology right now. 
That said, um, I think NOAA's current administration is doing an amazing job of helping accelerate innovation and collaborating with the private sector, more so than in the past. You know, we were just awarded a grant from NOAA to take our S2S forecasts and integrate them into hydro models to get better S2S hydro metrics like drought in the U.S. I think that's really promising, not just for us, but for the industry generally. And I, I think whether agencies that put their heads down and ignore the private sector advances will likely find that they're falling further and further behind their mission. You know, I, I think we've seen that a little bit uh, with climate risk analytics or climate services, as they're now being called, where, you know, over the last almost decade, hundreds of millions of dollars have been poured into that sector. And now government academia are kind of playing catch up and trying to figure out, like, what's our role here? Because we really need to have a role here. You know, so there's a lot of conversation going on. And it's it's not clear what the solution is for all of this. It's, it's actually really complicated because so much of this, what we're talking about, you, you can make the argument that it, it it's innovation that should be a public good, you know, and, and there are equity issues that need to be considered. So it's going to be a really interesting area to watch. And, you know, we look forward to being a good citizen, I would say, in the ecosystem. Also a an important collaborator, right? To, to go back Absolutely. to your answer there. Um, I really like uh, ending ending the podcast on on that kind of uh, positive note from a, a collaboration perspective. So the last three questions, real quick lightning round questions we have. The first is, what is the most memorable weather event in your life? Winter Storm Uri 2021, aka the Texas Freeze. I was actually driving cross country and got stuck in a hotel room in Nashville with my dog for three days. Oh my goodness. I was watching the tragedies unfold on TV. You know, a lot of lives lost, a lot of damage in Texas and around Texas. And I was talking to friends that lived there who were impacted. They didn't have any heat or water and it was, it was pretty scary. But it was also the first time in that hotel room that I chatted with the salient team. Then actually it was interesting because a couple of months after that, Salient wrote a blog on how its AI model caught a strong signal of this, you know, event before the government models. Um, and I started wondering, huh, if there was an extra week's notice, like what would have gone differently? And that's, that's actually when I started getting really interested in what Salient was doing. Very cool and very appropriate for what we're talking about today. All right. Choose your adventure, tornado chasing, skydiving, space tourist, or name your own. I'm going to name my own. It's maybe a little bit less exciting than the other options or less extreme. I I, uh, I think open water rowing is going to be the next frontier for me. My brother and I are building boats together this summer uh, up in Maine. And we both Very rowed cool. crew from college. And I don't know, living near the coast in New England, I just have the strong desire to enjoy the water more, visit all those little islands that are dotted along the coast and, you know, just find some of the more remote places out there. I am all for it. We had the, uh, a set of kayaks when I lived in Florida before, and uh, it's just something about being out on the water. Brings a little bit of peace to you. That's for Absolutely. sure. All right, what is your superpower? Okay, I have moments of being a bit of a stress case, but I would say <laughs> in general, <laughs> I'm pretty calm under pressure, and that is my superpower. I, my wife and I have three kids, uh, so I've seen a lot. And honestly, not that much phase anymore. <laughs> um, and as a result, I think I'm able to make, for the most part, very good, clear-headed decisions. Um, and I've also geeked out a bit on decision science classes over the years. It's just an area that I really enjoyed digging into. So, Well, as a CEO, a lot of times the best CEOs are the, are the ones that are calm, under pressure, uh, where, you know, there may be a lot of chaos going on, but you're there steering the ship. So Matt, uh, it's been great to have you on the Chippewa Point. What a great conversation today. All the best to you and Salient Predictions. I really appreciate you being on the show today with us. Yeah, thank you. I love what you're doing. And uh, thanks for having me keep up the great work. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Triple Point podcast. If you liked it, subscribe to our newsletter at triplepointpodcast.com. Give us a shout and a five-star rating on your favorite podcast station and tell your friends about it. Or you can email us at triplepointpodcast at the number 81degrees.com. Until next time, have a great week.